to reiterate the subject of this hour, the distinguished speakers at this dais, and I will introduce them very shortly, will each focus their presentations on recent developments in the geopolitical dynamics of Egypt and the Maghreb countries to the west, particularly Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria, respectively. Several earlier speakers at this conference have noted the recently strange, uh, strained or changing relationships between the US and one or more of the African, North African countries, uh, particularly Egypt. Fortunately, this panel, this panel has gathered ample expertise to provide, as they say in slang, the skinny uh, on the US-Egypt and US-North Africa discord tension outlook these days. Watching the often bleak news headlines on recent developments in North Africa has been, uh, at the very least, worrisome. Again, we look to our panelists to help us understand the less salient, the more underlying trend lines and, uh, uh, on the region. Change is hard, and it's often messy. And that is what most of North African countries are experiencing in the process of this fundamental transformation. How can the violence, instability, massive, almost insurmountable security concerns, vulnerability of the citizens, not to mention the dire economic cost and consequences, which as you know are the la daily landscape associated with the ongoing political turbulence be mitigated? In an interesting but brief article I recently read by uh, one Alex Reichard, the author noted that Egypt's and the US's revolutions were not so different after all. Drawing this parallel, Reichard wrote, and I quote, as violence between liberal secularists and conservative Islamists threatened civil war, so did the dispute between Federalists and Republicans. The, con the, co the construction of a country and its laws is an ongoing struggle. In his conclusion, Reichert reminded that there was no specific day in American history when the US sprouted from scattered dysfunction into a cohesive beacon of freedom and democracy. Thought-provoking for this region under the deliberations here today. Now, without further ado, let me introduce the panelists in the order of the presentations. You have their bios in front of you, so I will not go over those uh, in detail. Our first speaker is Dr. Paul Sullivan, to my left here, currently professor of economics at the National Defense University and an adjunct professor of security studies at Georgetown University and an adjunct senior fellow for future global resources, threats at the Federation of American Scientists, and a member of the Water Security and Conflict uh, Prevention Trust Initiative. Dr. Sullivan will speak about some of the conditions that are leading to Libya's and Egypt's current dark paths in the series of vicious circles. Lastly, Dr. Sullivan will offer some solutions and hopefully some rays of hope. Uh, the next speaker to our right at the end is Ms. Alex Arief. With, uh, uh, she'll follow Dr. Sullivan as our second panelist. Ms. Arief is an analyst on Africa and the Maghreb at the Congressional Research Service, where she's, where she's responsible for preparing independent, nonpartisan policy research for members of Congress and their staff. Ms. Arief plans to make her remarks on recent developments in Tunisia and Algeria, with particular emphasis on expectations of upcoming leadership transitions in both countries, or maybe the lack thereof in some cases. We shall see. Uh, to my left back again is Mr. Karim Hagag, a former career diplomat, uh, and our third panelist is currently a visiting professor at the Near East South Asia, known uh, by the acronym NISA, Center for Strategic Studies, U.S. Department of Defense, National Defense University. In his address, Dr. Haggad will pivot back to Egypt, the most populous Arab country in the region, and focus his remarks on the political developments there. Mr. Haggad will share his views on the U.S.-Egypt relations, as well as Egypt's future foreign policy orientation. Immediately to follow, the fourth panelist will be His Excellency Ambassador Mohammed Tofiq to my right, 
Ambassador Tofik was appointed as Egypt's first ambassador to the United States of America and was accredited after the January 25th, 2011 revolution. For those who attended the 2012 Policymakers Conference last year here, Ambassador Tofik was then a luncheon keynote speaker. For comparison and contrasting, I recommend that you find at the National Council's website, of course, and reread his speech on Egypt, which C-SPAN covered fully. This afternoon, Ambassador will comment uh, and observe on the three preceding uh, remarks. Last but not least, <laughs> uh, we have as commentator also Dr. Najib Ayachi, who is founder and president of the Maghreb Center, the only American think tank currently dedicated exclusively to North American issues. Dr. Ayachi, North African, North, uh, African sorry, not the. Well, maybe in the future you'll add that to your portfolio. <laughs> Dr. Yayachi also serves as a development specialist with international development organizations and agencies. Again, the rest of his bio information, as well as those of the other panelists you have in your conference booklets. As commentator, Dr. Ayachi will likely give a brief, brief synopsis on each of the Maghreb countries c considered here today. Dr. Sullivan, I call you to the podium. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum. Again, John Duke, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, it's an honor to be on a panel with you and the others. Uh, I'm thinking about what Ambassador Smith had to say about the old ways not working anymore. They certainly do not. And it's time we started to rethink those ways. And what Ambassador Leon said about the worst of times could be the best of times. Well, for a business person who's willing to wear cowboy boots and take the risks, sometimes the worst of times, if not too bad, are the times to take the initiative. I have to start with a caveat. My opinions or mine alone do not represent those of the National Defense University, the government of the United States or any other entity I may be associated with. So now I can get myself into a little bit of trouble. The other day I was asked by a very important Egyptian businessman what US policy toward Egypt is. I told him I don't know. It's rather confusing. What I do know is that cutting back on aid to Egypt is a mistake. And it could end up to be a grave mistake and a loss of our leverage in that country and in the region. Egypt is in the middle of a war on terror. Time to wake up about that. Against extremist elements in the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist organization going as far to the dangerous side is Al-Qaeda and Hamas. Part of the reason the people of Egypt rejected President Morsi and the Brotherhood was because of their growing closeness to Hamas and other such groups. There was a meeting attended by the former president where there was discussion of recruiting Egyptian young men to the so-called Jihad in Syria. That certainly made people in Egypt unhappy and worried. The failure of the Morsi administration to help resolve the serious economic issues and its complete lack of will to bring in others to help solve those issues also took them down. The people of Egypt spoke in the millions in that late June 2013 day when they hit the streets saying, Irhal, go. There are many, people, many reasons why the people rejected this failed leadership. There is a lot of fact out there about the violence of the opposition carrying weapons. I have lists of weapons, including air-to-ground missiles that have been used against police stations. But this is all in the past. 
Hopefully, there may be some solution here. We need to be concerned about the instabilities that the first revolution against Mubarak have developed, and also the instabilities that the election, I'm not sure whether I should put that in quotes, and ousting of the former president Morsi have brought about. Violence remains in the country. The recent attacks in the Sinai and on the Coptic church are indications that this is far from over. The demonstrations that turned violent in Al-Azhar the other day is another indication. However, the security situation on the streets of Egypt seems to be improving day to day. But the menace of extremism lurks within Egypt every day, and even more so every night. It will take a long time to settle this anger and instability. I think we are fooling ourselves if we think this can be over in two to, or even five years. It could take much longer. What happens during and after the trial of former President Morsi could determine a lot of what happens for a long time. There are still weapons floating about in Egypt including lots of man pads, heavy machine guns, and the like. Pistols and AK-47s are a common choice of weapons for extremists in the country. The drive-by shooting recently and car bombs are back. I lived in Egypt in the 1990s. I can still remember the sound of glass when a bank was blown up not far from me. It is so sad to see this happening to such a great country. Many of these weapons in Egypt came in from Libya. Libya still has massive caches of weapons that are finding their way to Mali, to Egypt, to Sudan, and all over the region. The drugs and thugs trade in Central Sahara, the entirety of Central Sahara, is helping to fuel the arms trade in North Africa and beyond. I am sometimes amazed at the amount of money floating around supporting some of these extremist groups. Instead of cutting off aid to the Egyptian military, we should be helping Egypt track down these financial networks and track down the extremists and terrorists that threaten us all. Libya is facing continuous instability. The kidnapping of the prime minister recently, the closing down of major ports, the violent attacks on foreign embassies and so forth certainly lead things not in a particularly good direction. The killing of Ambassador Stevens will not be forgotten here. Libya is having great difficulty in its slow development of its government. One of the reasons behind that is Gaddafi destroyed the country. He took apart the government and he destroyed the idea of nationhood and citizenship for its people. The country has no real history in democratic development. Trying to superimpose expats with some understanding of democracy is not working. Regional and tribal differences seem to be widening. Floating heavy and light weapons remain menacing aspects of the country, as does the influence of militias, which recently was estimated to have 250,000 persons as members. The militias and the people of Libya have to look at not a zero-sum game. They have to look at working together to move forward. One could look at an analogy for both of these countries. Certainly Egypt is in better shape right now. Going back to the time of the prophet Muhammad, when the tribes disagreed about carrying the rock of the Kaaba, what did Muhammad do? He handed over his cloak for the tribal leaders to carry. Maybe it is time to start thinking in that direction in this part of the world, how difficult it might be.
And again, I'm not an American looking down on this. I've had a lot of experience in this part of the world and in my own way would like to help. One of the problems with American policy is a sense of condescension. And that's certainly not going to work in the future. I don't know how many diplomats I've run into who look down on their noses at the people they're talking with. It's unfortunate. And that should stop. There's a lot of hope here. Libya has a small population in a vast land with a bunch of energy resources. It has a lot of opportunity in many fields. So why don't I get to the positive aspect of what could be facing these countries? Yes, the worst of times could be the best of times. So what can outside investors, Egyptian investors, and Libyan investors look at? Certainly energy in both countries. Oil and gas. Fantastic in Libya, and also great opportunities in Egypt that are still there and undiscovered. There's one thing I've learned from almost 30 years looking at the energy industry is you don't know until you know what's underground. But there's also hope in solar, in wind, tidal, in hydropower, waste to energy programs. Waste to energy is a way to get the garbage out of the rivers, out of the irrigation canals, fix up the health, and at the same time produce electricity. Distributed power is also an opportunity, particularly for Sinai, where things are the most unstable. That is, you don't have a grid network. If you have a grid network, that's an easy target. Separate these things out into the village and town levels. Generating plants, switching stations, and more will need upgrading and maintenance in both countries, more so in Libya than in Egypt, but Egypt needs that investment and expertise. One of the reasons for the low number of hours of electricity in Egypt is the lack of maintenance and investment during the revolution. Both countries need massive investments in their water systems, including extraction, transport, and treatment. Both countries likely will need a lot of investment in desalinization. Water will be a major issue for both as they move forward. In many ways, certain aid programs have lost their way. I won't name them, but we can all guess. The nanny state of governance didn't work. What counts? Roads, bridges, electricity, refineries, clinics, hospitals. And I have one minute. I could talk for 30 days about this. There's a lot of potential, of course, for security for businesses and important people. Food processing. Middleman services to alleviate transportation and communications problems. Actually, one of the real hopes in Egypt right now is the entrepreneurship that is being developed by the young people. And one of the smartest ones I saw was a middleman to deliver things in the middle of the revolution. That's entrepreneurship. And this kid did very well. And he found his funding from another Egyptian who was in the high-tech business. Can the U.S. do anything? Well, it better do the right thing. It better learn from its mistakes in the past. Excuse me, I work for the government, but sometimes I find some of the policies absurd. I think the private sector can make more of an impact than any government can. And there have been statements earlier today about the business people being the best diplomats in many ways. And often that is the case because they don't have to abide by bulletin points set in from Washington. They abide by making money, developing business, and developing relations. Certain development organizations get, should get back to their purpose, their original purpose, was, which was development not to bring democracy through NGOs that were essentially ineffective. 
And I know these are controversial. That's nothing new for me, for those of you in the room who know me. What I would like to see in my lifetime is that these two countries get back on their feet, start to develop, and that the United States can be a part of that in a positive way. And that sometime in the future, hopefully the near future, I can go to both countries with my children, feel safe, see the new prosperity, and see them moving forward. Thank you. Nice, hopeful uh, ending. Thank you, Dr. Sylvan. Next, uh, Ms. Arief. Tunisia and Algeria are her main subjects. As a uh, Western Maghreb specialist, it's always hard to follow an Egypt uh, speaker um, and convince the audience that uh, there's anywhere near the same level of urgency and <laughs> importance um, to the things that I follow. But uh, I, before starting, I'd, I'd like to uh, likewise thank the organizers and my fellow panelists for this opportunity um, and this discussion, which is very, which is as always very timely. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks on Algeria and Tunisia. Uh, both anticipating political transitions, albeit in radically different contexts. I am particularly interested in the ways in which each country seems to exemplify the political and social dilemmas in their own way of post-revolutionary North Africa and on the implications of recent events for regional security. I will conclude with a few thoughts on challenges for US policy. So to start off on Tunisia, Tunisia's transition, often regarded perhaps wrongly as relatively straightforward, has moved in fits and starts. Today marks two years, today, since the landmark 2011 Constituent Assembly elections, which provided at that time momentum to a process that has otherwise often appeared slow and unwieldy. However, many Tunisians, despite those relatively successful elections two years ago, appear to yearn for faster and more definite progress, albeit with often vastly divided and at times seemingly uh, irreconcilable expectations. Political and security challenges combined with developments in Egypt keenly observed from Tunis have brought the process of transition to a halt. Today's inauguration of a national dialogue exemplifies the ways in which Tunisian leaders on the positive side have so far managed to use dialogue to bring Tunisia back from the cliff again and again. However, the dialogue and ongoing protests also today, uh, as we've seen also today, also underscore the fragility of Tunisia's transitional gains and the persistent deep gulf of mistrust among political factions uh, that has led to the current government par paralysis. Tensions over the content of a new draft constitution and the future electoral system, among other things, have been brought to a head by deepening security challenges. These include two assassinations this year of prominent secularist figures, also sporadic rioting and other types of violence by religious conservative actors, as well as apparent Tunisian and foreign jihadist training and recruitment activities on Tunisian soil. Today, for example, there has reportedly been a shootout between militants and security forces in the, Sidi Bouzid, in the city of Sidi Bouzid. Tunisians are also thought to constitute a large share of foreign fighters in Syria. Critics of the ruling Anada party have accused it of not doing enough to prevent and punish Salafists who seek to intimidate secular activists, university professors, political opponents, and others they see as reprehensible. They help. Critics also, fairly or not, view Anada as at best insufficiently committed to counterterrorism and at worst complicit in violent extremism, even as the government has taken a more muscular stance toward extremist groups in recent months. The government's critics further accuse Anada of trying to fix the political system and infiltrate core state institutions in order to guarantee their future political dominance and advance certain social norms. 
Conversely, Anatha leaders point to their willingness to engage in compromise and coalitions with secular and other actors. Party leaders understandably fear that their secularist opponents are trying to use populist tactics and in their view, possible alliances of convenience with deep state elements from the Ben Ali era to exclude them from future political participation. Perhaps most worryingly, tensions along, those line, along these lines increasingly seem to be influencing the relationship between government leaders and the security forces. Whether it would be preferable at this point to dissolve the government prior to deciding a path forward on the draft constitution which has been subject at this point to multiple rounds of negotiations and revisions, and on new elections, is of course subject to debate and is the object of this national dialogue that has only just begun. To change tracks to Algeria, Algeria presents a very different set of issues as it confronts a long-anticipated double transition. First, a leadership transition from ailing President Bouteflika to a new president, whether this takes place next year with scheduled presidential elections or at some future date pending possible constitutional changes and or a fourth term bid by Bouteflika. And second, the generational shift that is taking place or must take place at some point as members of the revolutionary generation retire or pass away, having been the dominant force in politics and security for a half century. As Algerians confront political uncertainty, if not the turmoil experienced elsewhere, the questions Algeria watchers asked themselves in 2011 remain relevant. In particular, given the pace of events in the region over the past two and a half years, can we continue to expect that pra past practices and stability will hold in the future? With regard to regional insecurity, Algeria is more accustomed than Tunisia to being at the forefront of regional security challenges. Despite the high-profile terrorist hostage seizure at a remote gas facility in southeastern Algeria in January of this year and other sporadic ongoing attacks, the security forces have continued to seemingly marginalize remnant violent extremist act factions on Algerian soil. Some of these have moved elsewhere in the region, of course, as we know, with sometimes disastrous consequences. However, the opacity of Algerian policymaking, the potential for competing interests within the inner reaches uh, of senior state authority, as well as the focus on domestic succession issues, have hindered Algeria's efforts to position itself as a leader in regional security and counterterrorism. To conclude with a few thoughts on challenges for US policy, in Algeria as elsewhere, US policymakers face a difficult balance of protecting and deepening hard-fought security cooperation while contending with an often difficult environment for foreign investment and occasionally attempting to nudge Algerian leaders to undertake liberalizing reforms that could uh, bolster the country's future stability. This discussion is all the more difficult as US policymakers have few levers of influence in Algeria and as Algerian leaders are famously protective of their hard-fought independence. The opacity of Algerian decision-making is exemplified by the debate over constitutional revisions ongoing since April 2011, which have yet to be publicly revealed, though some content has begun to be leaked to the press. The negative example of security challenges arising from weakened and or transitional states elsewhere in the region present a further challenge to those attempting to make progress on reforms, whether in Algeria or elsewhere. In Tunisia, supposed to be the good child of the Arab Spring, US policymakers who have invested in the post-revolutionary bilateral relationship are confronted today with political uncertainty and rising insecurity, including apparent threats to US personnel. Tunisian leaders appear to be more interested than their Algerian counterparts in welcoming Western cooperation and assistance. Still, they must also contend with domestic pressures and some anti-Western sentiment. US policymakers continue to debate the degree to which foreign aid and bilateral contacts provide leverage in pursuing goals such as countering terrorism and encouraging certain democratic values. I'll leave it there uh, only by saying that I, I envy neither the Tunisian leadership nor US policymakers who have to decide a way forward.
Thank you, Alexis. <coughs> Dr. Karim, uh, uh, Mr. Hagag, next on the left side. Are you going to be able to stand up? Um, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, allow me to add my word of thanks to the National Council uh, for inviting me back to this very prestigious annual gathering. Um, it is particularly difficult when I speak after my esteemed senior colleague from the National Defense University, Paul Sullivan, uh, and before my esteemed senior colleague, uh, Ambassador Taufik, uh, who, who will be speaking after me. Uh, I feel caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, having acknowledged that risk, uh, what I would like to discuss briefly uh, this afternoon is and, and focus on the uh, issue of uh, Egyptian foreign policy. Now, obviously, much of the intention in Washington and globally is justifiably fixated on the very dramatic domestic developments that are playing out uh, in Egypt, uh, especially in the wake of the June 30th revolution. However, these developments pose a very interesting question as to what has been the impact overall on the course of Egyptian foreign policy. And I would argue that the transformative political developments that we are seeing uh, in Egypt will have a very important impact uh, on the course and trajectory of Egyptian foreign policy and national security policy moving forward. The changes will be subtle, but I would argue important. This is also important because Egyptian foreign policy still matters, and matters a great deal. Egypt, of course, remains the largest Arab country. One in five Arabs is Egyptian. Egypt possesses the largest and the most sophisticated Arab military, as well as the most robust and active diplomatic and national security apparatus. And despite much of the commentary regarding the decline of Egypt's regional role, Egypt still remains very much the trendsetter when it comes to political and cultural trends in the region. In fact, one could argue that the intense interest in what goes on in Egypt is precisely because the outcome of the revolution that is playing out in Egypt will have a very deep and long-lasting impact throughout the region, whether in terms of the future of political Islam, developments in the Arab-Israeli arena, the shifting balance of power in the region in light of the rise of Iran, the decline of Syria, and the ascendant role of the Gulf. So the course of Egyptian foreign policy warrants a close look. Now, in looking at the course of Egypt's foreign policy since the January 2011 revolution, we see elements of both continuity and elements of change. Continuity in the sense that despite two revolutions, the ouster of two presidents, both of whom faced criminal pr prosecution at the same time, no less than six changes of government since January 2011, a novel yet very unfortunate failure uh, in terms of the experiment of political Islam uh, in governance uh, when it comes to Egypt. Despite all this, the fundamental pillars of Egyptian foreign policy have remained largely unchanged. Egypt has upheld its commitment to the peace treaty with Israel, Contrary to expectations since the fall of the Mubarak regime, there has been no strategic opening towards Iran. The border regime with Gaza is very much the same, and this even despite the warming relationship, as Paul mentioned, between Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood government under Morsi. And Egypt's strategic relationship with the United States remains largely intact, although more on that in a minute. That being said, what is new is the reassertion of Egyptian nationalist sentiment and national identity in a very forceful way. Now, this is a critical dimension that goes to the heart 
of the political changes that we're witnessing in Egypt. And these changes relate very much to the issue of foreign policy. Because conventional wisdom in much of Washington and Western capitals more broadly was that the revolutions that have been playing out in Egyptian politics were very much about domestic grievances. Now, this is certainly true. However, I would argue that foreign policy was an important factor in what I call the subtext of the revolutions. Because what's often overlooked is that foreign policy was a critical issue that contributed to the delegitimization of both the Mubarak regime and the presidency of uh, Dr. Morsi. With regards to Mubarak, it was the popular perception of having subordinated Egyptian interests to the priorities of the United States and the perception of Egypt's complicity in the siege of Gaza, among other things. With regards to President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood's tenure in government, the popular backlash on issues of foreign policy was particularly acute. The backlash against Egypt's isolation from the Arab fold, especially with the de deterioration of relationships between Egypt and the Gulf. The ineptitude that we saw in terms of handling Egypt's vital national security interests with regards to the Nile Basin, and especially the rift with Ethiopia. The sectarianizing of Egyptian foreign policy, especially with regards to Syria, and Paul mentioned the issue of opening a jihadist front against the Assad regime uh, through Egyptian participation in the civil war. But perhaps most importantly, we have the issue of the Sinai and the exacerbation of the very serious security situation that we've seen develop in the peninsula. By releasing convicted terrorists from prison, many of whom were later implicated in terrorist activities in the Sinai, the failure to shut down the illicit tunnel trade through the Gaza Strip, and holding back the Egyptian military from imposing law and order uh, on the Sinai Peninsula. Now, together with the failures of the domestic issues uh, with which the Morsi administration failed to get a handle on, as Paul mentioned. All of these contributed to the complete repudiation by Egyptians against the Morsi presidency. And we've seen that in a very forceful way in the revolution that ensued on June 30th. The largest political demonstrations in recent history, followed by the ouster of the first democratically elected president in Egyptian history. This was very much driven by this renewed sense of Egyptian national identity and Egyptian nationalism. Now, why this is important for the future course of Egyptian foreign policy is because with the reassertion of Egyptian national identity, what we will see and what we are already seeing is a strong reaffirmation and defense of Egyptian national interests that were seen to have been compromised by the Muslim Brotherhood during their tenure. And I would argue that this element will be an important factor shaping the course of Egyptian foreign policy in very important ways. And we are already seeing this in several respects. We see this most clearly with Egypt's re-engagement with Africa and in particular on the issue of the sharing of the Nile waters with the diffusing of the political crisis with Ethiopia. Now, in a country with a population of 90 plus million people, projected to exceed 100 million by early next decade, rising energy needs, the issue of food security and the ongoing issue of water security, resource politics will become an integral factor in shaping Egyptian national security policy moving forward. We also see this in Egypt's renewed interest and engagement in the Palestinian-Israeli peace process. This is important because in contrast to the ambiguity that characterized the Muslim Brotherhood's position on the question of the two-state solution, 
for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, we see a reassertion of Egypt's traditional position of two states for two peoples, based on Israel's full withdrawal from the occupied territories, and the creation of a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. At some point, if the negotiations reach fruition, both parties and the United States will have to look for regional support, and Egypt will be critical uh, in this regard. We also see it with the return of Egypt to the Arab fold and repairing the strained relationship between Egypt and the Gulf, and that will come with a much closer coordination on issues of Gulf security, the peace process, and regional non-proliferation and disarmament issues more broadly. We see it very forcefully in the reassertion of Egyptian sovereignty in the Sinai. Particularly, this is a very emotional issue for Egyptians who argue that Egyptians did not fight and die to liberate Sinai from the Israeli occupation, only to see it lost in a rising wave of terrorism and lawlessness. Hence, we see a much more robust campaign against terrorist elements operating in the Sinai. This also explains the difficult relationship between the Hamas regime uh, and Egypt, not out of any ideological concerns uh, regarding Hamas, but purely out of concerns, thank you, out of concerns of Hamas activities in Gaza compromising Egypt's sovereignty in the Sinai. In short, what we will see is a reassertion of Egypt's traditional leadership role anchored in Egyptian national interests, but with a sense of independence and renewed activism. Which brings me to the final point regarding the future of the US-Egyptian relationship. Now, Paul talked about the decision regarding the suspension or partial suspension of elements of US assistance to Egypt. And I think that goes to the heart of the problem, which I think we need to be extremely explicit about when assessing the future of the relationship between Cairo and Washington. And in my view, the problem has to do with the fundamental divergence of the narratives in Washington and Cairo regarding what exactly happened on June 30th and the aftermath of the revolution. Because despite the very, what I think, nuanced approach that the administration has attempted to adopt. President Obama himself acknowledged the failures of the governance on the part of the Muslim Brotherhood. He has refrained from calling June 30th a coup, and he recognized the po popular backing for the overthrow of President Morsi. Despite this, there remains a fundamental gap in the narrative between the United States and Egypt regarding what is going on. The US narrative seems to regard what is happening in Egypt as a political crisis that should be resolved through political means, hence the emphasis on inclusion and a negotiated outcome uh, with regards to resolving the polarizing divisions we see in Egypt. This is very different than the Egyptian narrative. From the point of view of, of Egyptians, this is not just another political crisis, but an existential moment that will define the future of Egypt as a state and as a society. The problem with the Muslim Brotherhood's tenure in government goes beyond simply the failure of governance. It relates to the use of the very divisive sectarian rhetoric and in a country that houses or harbors the largest Christian community in the Middle East, this was a particularly difficult issue. It had to do with the use of religion to vilify and delegitimize political opponents. It had to do with giving political cover to terrorist activities and the careless handling of vital Egyptian national security interests. In short, it was a threat to the very identity of Egypt as a state and as a society, as a moderate, pluralist, religiously tolerant society. Now, against this backdrop, and with this I will close, we can understand why U.S. attempts to use military assistance as leverage has played out extremely negatively 
in terms of public opinion in Egypt. Not so much on the part of the civilian government, but on the level of public opinion in general. Not only does this decision reinforce the misperception of a patron-client relationship, which the US-Egyptian relationship is not, it is a strategic partnership, but it symbolizes to Egyptians a repudiation of their revolution. Because when Americans say that there is a division in Egypt, yes. However, it is not a division down the middle. This is not a 50-50 split between the parties on both sides. It is a division between the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand and the broad center of Egyptians that have risen up to repudiate and reject their ideology. At the risk of differing with the moderator, which is not a very smart thing to do, there is no civil war uh, in Egypt. In looking at the ramifications of the administration's decisions, I will close with two comments. What will happen and what will not happen in Egypt? First, what will not happen in Egypt? For those who expect that leveraging US assistance will influence the course of developments in Egypt, I fear they may be disappointed. The revolution in Egypt will be decided by Egyptians very much independent of external intervention and certainly independent of external pressure. Secondly, what I think might happen, the decision on the part of the administration will prompt a, an Egyptian reevaluation in Cairo of the US-Egyptian relationship in conjunction perhaps with a diversification of Egypt's strategic relationships with other countries. Now, it's important to note that my expectation at least is that this will not be done in a rash or in a fit, fit of pique against the United States, but with the same deliberation and forethought that marked the administration's decision in its reevaluation of assistance to Egypt. At the end of the day, the United States and Egypt sh still share strong bonds of common interests in regional peace and regional security. However, what we can expect is that Egypt's reevaluation of its relationship with Washington will be done in a way that draws a very sharp distinction between preserving those interests on the one hand and preserving the independence of Egyptian policy on the other hand whether regards to regional issues or, more importantly, domestic developments in Egypt. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haggad, for that clarification. Uh, I just want to mention, before we came on the podium here, uh, I learned from Mr. Haggad that uh, this is actually his uh, last week in Washington. Uh, he's leaving NISA to return to, he's a, uh, somewhat seconded from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and will go back to Cairo next week. So please let's give him another round of applause and thank you very much. Thank you. For your help. Uh, next, uh, Ambassador Tofik, please help us with the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the Council of uh, National U.S. Arab Relations for inviting me again this year. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be among such a distinguished group. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to uh, speak to comment on uh, these uh, very eloquent and very well thought remarks made by three distinguished scholars. And in a sense, it makes my, uh, my job so much easier because some of the things that I would have liked to say but couldn't have already been said. And uh, in a sense, uh, uh, I have a little bit more time to uh, look towards the future. Um, I was... Uh, attending the joint IMF World Bank meetings uh, a couple of weeks ago. And 
uh, on my way out, I met uh, a, a distinguished personality who had be who had been very uh, who is very prominent in the world of international economics, and he uh, shook my hand and said, "I'm very optimistic for Egypt," and I said, "Why?" Uh, and he said, "Because of that video of the of the boy," and I said. What, what video of the, of the boy? He said, you haven't seen the video of the boy? <laughs> I said, I've seen many videos, but I'm not quite sure. He said, I'll send you the link. And actually, the next day, he e emailed me the link. And I watched that, that link. And it had nothing to do with, with uh, international economics. It was basically an 11-year-old boy uh, being interviewed by some, some television uh, personality. Uh, and he was commenting on, on uh, political issues, and uh, I, could, I could feel the reaction of the person interviewing them. He said somebody has uh, given, given this, this boy the, 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 a few lines to say, and he was trying to you know, put the questions in many different ways to see if the boy actually was actually reciting something he had learned by heart. But to, uh, to his surprise and to mine, the little boy really understood what he was talking about. And uh, that little boy uh, gave me a, a, lot of, a lot of hope for the future. And uh, that basically uh, reminded me that in the past less than three years, young people from Egypt have brought down two regimes. And basically, the two regimes made the same mistakes. They took these young people for granted. They did not open up the opportunities for these young people. And in a sense, this is the one uh, theme that would uh, uh, be common in all the, the uh, countries of North Africa today. Uh, Starting with this note of optimism, I'm, I, I don't want to underestimate the challenges that we are facing. But what I do want to point out is that these are not uh, vicious cycles repeating themselves again and again. Basically, we are in a learning process. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. The next time we try to get it a little bit more right. Uh, at the, uh, after the first revolution or the first wave of, of revolution, the question that was prominent among Egyptians was, what shall we do? Shall we start off by writing a constitution, putting together a system, a democratic system, uh, putting together checks and balances, and then start selecting people for parliament and, and uh, electing a president? Or should we try and move ahead as quickly as we can uh, and start with the elections first? And uh, unfortunately, we did, we did it the wrong way. We started with elections first. And the first thing that the, the president who had been elected did was try to grab as much power as possible for himself and to try and uh, write the new constitution in a way that would be uh, most favorable for himself and his group. Uh, and of course, the reaction was that the whole experiment did not work out. Uh, now we're trying to do it right. Now we, we have started with the phase of trying to put together a constitution. Uh, now it's more messy, of course, because in, in the, the last time, in the, in the ending phases of the constitution writing process, it was only one ideology that was sitting in the room. And it was easy for them to, to uh, agree on a constitution within a 24-hour period. Now we have representatives of all the constituencies in the countries, in the country. We have representatives of the artists and representatives of the religious institutions. We have representatives of women's groups, of trade unions, of uh, uh, the business community, um, of political parties. And it's not an easy job. But what we see now is a genuine attempt to reach something 
that everybody can live with, uh, that maybe not everybody will be 100% happy with, but that, that everybody can live with, and reach a framework that will not enable anyone in the future to try and usurp power. Uh, if we do that, and if we succeed in doing that on time, as I'm sure we will, we will have taken an enormous step because now the checks and balances will be there in place before we have actually, we know who actually who's going to be elected to both parliament and, and the presidency. Uh, having said that, uh, when we have succeeded in doing that, and I know we will, we will be doing that by next summer, we will have the whole framework in place with the parliament and the president. But that will not be enough, because th th basically that's, that's institutions. We've put together institutions. We haven't done much about the culture, and that will be uh, an, an additional job that we will need to work at very hard. But even after that, the main causes for the revolution have not been addressed, because people still need those opportunities. Uh, young people still need the education and the training. They still need the jobs. And so uh, what is happening right now, that in, in parallel with this political process, we have an equally robust and well thought out economic process that's going on. And let, let me just tell you, uh, in the past month and a half, or just the past month, or even less than a month, uh, my experiences here in, in, in the United States, First of all, there was a, a group of economists from different parts of the, con of, of the world, actually, and of the country, uh, including Egyptians, of course, who came together to discuss how to find ways, ways and means to push forward the Egyptian economy. And they put forward some very good recommendations. And we, we got the, the, the deputy prime minister from Egypt who is in charge of uh, the economic issues. Uh, and certainly, I've already found that some of these ideas are actually uh, being implemented now. The other thing we did is we got our uh, Minister for Investment over here to New York. And he had a very good meeting with US investors. And you'd be surprised. I was surprised. Not only how many people attended and how enthusiastic they were, but how interested they were in investing in Egypt today. And uh, the reason was very clear. The representatives from the US companies who, ha who have already invested in Egypt, who are present in Egypt, gave a very straightforward statement. No one has left Egypt. They have all continued to operate in Egypt. And they are all making a profit. So. Uh, that's straight, uh, as straight as uh, a message as, as you can get. The third thing that happened this, this afternoon, actually, over lunch, I was having lunch with, with some friends. And in the restaurant, I met uh, one of the leaders of the US Chamber of Commerce. And we had been working with the US Chamber to uh, put together a delegation of US business leaders to go to Egypt and uh, get them a little bit away from the trap of the media and to see things for themselves. And, uh, and he told me, we're committed. We'll be there in January. So uh, the, the economic uh, aspect is very important. It's going to go on. We have received, as all of you know, a lot of assistance from some of our, 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 our friends in the neighborhood. Um, and the question, again, is how are we going to use those funds? Uh, we could just spend them away and then uh, uh, find ourselves with a larger debt uh, and no progress. But that's not what we're, what we're going to do. We are putting together a robust, growth-oriented program that takes into account two elements. The first element is job creation. We need job, jobs for all those young people. And the second element 
is to deal with some of the inefficiencies in the system. There's lots of money to be saved because there's so much waste. And uh, you, can, you can actually deal with that uh, and we have put together, we, we are putting together a very good system that will be in place before the end of the year. So uh, on the, the economic side of things, things are happening. Uh, there's a stimulus package that has been announced. There are areas, Dr. Sullivan said, uh, was referring to energy and water. I would add to that uh, health and education because when people feel empowered, uh, they need services that, these, these kinds of services. And I think the potential there is enormous. Uh, the infrastructure area is em enormous. The Suez Canal corridor, the potential there is absolutely enormous. Um, now, looking, looking into the future, what have we gained? We know we have paid, we have paid a, a heavy cost. Uh, just, the, just last Sunday, there was a, an attack, a terrorist attack against a church in which four people, in, two of which were children, were killed and, and another 18 wounded. And uh, in addition to other such, such losses, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a high cost. Uh, and we have paid that and we will continue to uh, confront extremists and terrorists. Uh, but in the end, uh, th th there has to be something gained from this. And in addition to the political economic issue, there, there are very clear gains that have been made. The first gain that many people have not noticed is that in the past, you could have a candidate or a political party that would run and win elections simply with a religious no slogan. Karim has referred to is uh, this issue of national identity. Uh, Egypt is one of the countries, probably the country in the world with the most pronounced national identity. We know who we are because we've been there for such a long time. Um, and suddenly, during a period of one year, that national identity was threatened. There were actually people in the government who wanted to change the way Egyptians thought about themselves. There were people who were allied to those people in government who were suggesting that maybe we, we need to think about destroying the pyramids and the Sphinx. We had a, a regime in power that said, we're going to cut off funding for the National Ballet because it's immoral. Um, imagine what Egypt would be without the arts, without the history. So these, these kinds of issues uh, we have learned the value of these kinds of issues just because we had never felt before that they were threatened, but now for a brief moment they were under threat. Uh, the other important issue is the issue of regional solidarity. Uh, the countries in the region, many of them, have decided to come together and to take things, to take their futures into their own hands and to look for arrangements, regional arrangements, that may compensate for uh, any uh, lack of such arrangements with external powers. And that's also a very important thing and that's something to look for in, in the future. Uh, Finally, since I have uh, one minute left, I'm just going to say a few words about the relations with the United States. Uh, the relations with the United States are of a strategic nature for Egypt and for the United States. We have these common interests, and we would both like to preserve these common interests. However, in the last 30 years, the relations were left to stagnate. In a sense, they were taken for granted. And 
I don't think it's such a bad thing that both sides would say, okay, now we need to review, we need to take stock, we need to recalibrate, we need to see if what we're gaining from, from this and what we're giving into it, and we need to make sure that uh, we're getting a good deal. And uh, in, a good, in, in a way, that's a very good way of putting together building blocks for an even stronger relationship in the future. Uh, I think I finished on time. Thank you very much. Uh, one last word, uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, you said you were optimistic about uh, getting things back in order in Egypt in two to five years. You're pessimistic about that. Uh, it's the only point that I disagree with you on. Uh, I think we will be able to get things back to order in Egypt much, much sooner than you think. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your comprehensive uh, commentary on Egypt particularly. And now, again, last but not least, Dr. Ayachi for his commentary on the, uh, on the three preceding speakers. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dr. Anthony and the, his team for putting together this panel, among, among others. So one about North Africa and the Maghreb, which has been neglected <laughs> to a certain extent until now in, uh, in Washington, in gatherings of this, uh, of this type. So uh, I guess my, my role is to, uh, to summarize a little bit what has been said and, and make a few comments. We've talked um, a lot about Egypt comparatively to the other countries of the region, so I won't add too much about it. I'm just, um, I, I just know that there are, uh, between Dr. Sullivan and uh, Dr. Hagag, uh, there are, uh, the, they share basically the same analysis, although it, there is a persistence of authoritarian patterns in, in Egypt. And in this, now it's mostly uh, religious authoritarianism that uh, the country is dealing with. Um, Dr. Sullivan uh, thinks, believes that it will take time to set, settle things up. It will take a long time, which I guess you don't necessarily agree with, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, a long time is needed to reinstall law and order. But in order to achieve that, um, of course, Egypt has to go through its, its democratic, pursue the course of its democratic uh, transition, coming up with a new constitution um, and a new government and uh, a new economic development plan, which is indeed very important uh, because we tend to forget the economic dimension of the Arab Spring most of the time or the economic underpinnings of the Arab Spring. Uh, and it, it's, it's coming out with a new development. A new development model is key, a model that is more inclusive, that wouldn't leave so many young people behind, for example, people with a graduate degree, as we, we know. Uh, and that is valid not only for Egypt, but for the whole Arab region, and uh, the, including the countries of the Arab Spring, like Tunisia, Libya, etc. Uh, okay, Dr. Uh, Sullivan has emphasized, also the talk mentioned Libya. Uh, f I do agree with you. Libya, uh, Libya is going, it's going to be tough to settle things down there. There is no, yes, uh, because of the legacy of the Gaddafi era, there is no real nation state that was built there or formed, unlike Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, and Libya is divided in tribes. Uh, and uh, with fighting militias, uh, and this is indeed uh, a, a legacy of, of the Gaddafi era. Uh, now, uh, next to Libya is Tunisia, and Alexis uh, informed us of the latest development in Tunisia. There is in Tunisia a national dialogue that was started some time ago between the Islamists and the non-Islamists. Uh, things have been also a little um, the Tunisian society, like the Egyptian society to a certain extent, uh, has been polarized between Islamists and non-Islamists. In Tunisia as, as well, the, uh, the Islamists have tried to impose their agenda. 
but they were opposed not by the military in Tunisia. They, the military in Tunisia are not, and politically they, they, have, they don't have any influence, any power, but by a civil society organization and opposition parties. Uh, civil society is highly mobilized in Tunisia. They are opposing the, Islam, the, imposi opposing the imposition of the Islamist agenda. Uh, so uh, the Islamist today, is, as, as you reminded us, uh, is the second anniversary of the, uh, the election of the uh, uh, election of the Islamists, basically, and uh, the Islamist-led government in Tunisia, uh, where they have been elected for one year, but they made all they could to remain in power. <laughs> they were elected to write a constitution and to run the country until the next, next elections. Uh, and uh, they haven't done that. So that's why the, they've been opposed by civil society and uh, polit other political parties. And so the uh, transition in Tunisia has been a little bumpy because of that, but it's, there's a national dialogue. At least people are, I mean, the, the, the opposing parties are talking to each other. And, um, and uh, hopefully a, uh, the ANADA-led government is going to, to leave uh, and dismantle and leave. And a new government comprised of uh, technocrats is going to be put together for, from, for six months, I think. They will be in charge for six months until next elections, at least in principle, un until they finish writing the constitution and call on organize new elections. Um, um, you mentioned briefly Algeria. Algeria, not much has changed in Algeria, but also because the Algerians have had their own transition many years ago. Some years ago, I would say, in the 90s, when they did elect, the people elected the, uh, the Islamists, and the military stepped in and canceled the elections, which triggered a quasi-civil war. And, uh, so I think today the Algerians are happy with the situation the way it is, which is very static in many ways, and with uh, the same people in power, the same um, structure of power uh, in place, uh, the same president since then, uh, Bouteflika, who is uh, sick and old, but we might run again. Uh, and you mentioned the needed generation shift, which you didn't think was happening now, or at least you didn't see it happening or coming. So uh, there's a big question mark in relation to Algeria. Uh, you didn't, we didn't talk about Morocco. Let me touch on Morocco very quickly. Morocco, today Morocco has formed a new government. In Morocco as well, the Islamists were in, including a, a uh, coalition with a secular uh, conservative party. Uh, and, uh, but uh, they also failed somehow, and uh, the, the king, who still in, has uh, powers, has called for, uh, for the formation of a new government, which, which happened a few days ago only. So there is, um, and the king is reasserting himself in, uh, in the political process of, uh, of, uh, in Morocco. Uh, Morocco has initiated its own reform without revolution, <laughs> we can say. Um, in the past uh, few years. The uh, reforms were initiated by the government, by the king himself. S and, and then there as well, I mean, the main problems are economic in nature. They have to do with uh, an, uh, employment creation and, and so on. Uh, I guess I will end up here and take a few questions about uh, about uh, my talk. Thank you. Thank you. We, ra we are really, really running out of time. I think we have, we, we have at least 15 questions here and one minute left. So um, I'll try and uh, ask a couple of them here. Um, Dr. Sullivan, I want to ask uh, from how has the trend toward the increasing power of Islamist parties affected prospects for reform in the region? And together with that, I suppose, now after the successful crackdown, should Muslim Brotherhood be allowed to participate in upcoming elections or be 100% blamed, said somebody. And uh, let me just frame some of these questions and then maybe. 
What is Egypt's position on chemical weapons? When will Egypt sign uh, rat and ratify the Chemical Weapon Convention? Um, another uh, Egypt related, and I think this was uh, answered by both uh, Your Excellency Ambassador and Mr. Haggag, uh, and that is how can the GCC countries contribute more effectively than they already have to development and stability in Arab North Africa. Let's just deal with these for now, if possible. Dr. Steve. Uh, which question did you want me to handle? The rise uh, of the... Toward uh, increasing power of Islamist well, I parties. Don't see, I don't see that. I see a lot of pushback mm -hmm. in many places. Uh, they certainly are holding on in, in uh, Gaza because the people of Gaza have no choice. They seem to be becoming more powerful in Syria because Syria is a bloodbath. And they're taking advantage of the situation. In Egypt, they were pushed back. The Muslim Brotherhood is outlawed the last time I checked. That's not exactly the rising of an Islamist power. Tunisia, they're getting pushed back. Algeria, there's been pushed back since 1992. We'll see how that results. Moroccan elections, they were in a lot weaker position than they were the last round. I'm not sure where they're getting stronger, maybe in Yemen, but that's hard to judge. Uh, again, they, they had shown a certain bankruptcy of ideology. Jordan, there's some power in the Brotherhood. Second most powerful person in Jordan might be the head of the Brotherhood, but that's a different situation. The King Hussein, father of the present king, was smart as a fox. He brought them in. He co-opted them. And he reduced the threat from them. But now they're coming back in a different way. We'll have to see. Inshallah. Um, would you like to take the chemical weapon question? Um, be before the CWC question, very quickly, on this issue of the participation of the Muslim Brotherhood in parliamentary elections, I would be highly surprised if when parliamentary elections do come that the Brotherhood does not participate in the elections. I think we can see the Brotherhood participating as independents. That has always been the pattern for the participation of the Brotherhood in Egyptian elections, irrespective of the legality or illegality of their movement. But that brings up the larger question of the formal integration of the Brotherhood into Egyptian politics. And I think desirable as that goal might be, and I for one think it is desirable, it is extremely difficult if we do not see some introspection and reassessment on the part of the Brotherhood. As of now, the Brotherhood seems to be in denial of everything that has happened in Egypt, in denial of the millions that have risen up against them, in denial of the serious mistakes that they have made during their tenure in government, and so for, their, for the, the need for reconciliation and integration, I think there is a prerequisite of some sort of introspection on the part of the Brotherhood. On the issue of the CWC, Egypt was one of the lead negotiators uh, of the Chemical Weapons Convention back in the early 90s. As part of its vision for a region, for a Middle East free of all weapons of mass destruction, Egypt took a position of not signing the CWC until there is progress made on the part of the universality of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We all know it's a very unfortunate situation that Israel is the only country in the region that is not only not a party to the NPT, but not a full party to any global disarmament mechanism, whether it's the BWC, the CWC, uh, and the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So e Egypt has linked its signature on the CWC to broader movement on uh, the universality of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Thank you. Uh, um, there are many Egypt-related questions. I'm going to quickly jump to Ms. Arief. Uh, uh, what are some of the challenges you uh, have encountered while con uh, conducting research in Algeria? Any particular example? The 
the question. That's a good question. Um, certainly, Algeria is not the easiest uh, environment for outside researchers, and I think that uh, U.S. policymaking and, to a large degree, you know, U.S.-based analysis of Algeria suffers from that from that fact that uh, I think last year at the same conference I, I spoke solely on Algeria and one of the points that I tried to make is that we really don't know enough about what Algerians think about their own political trajectory or their own desired um, future paths and that continues to be a, a major stumbling block. I have the great fortune to be you know, a US government employee and with all of the sort of access that that might entail, certainly I'm hindered um, in some ways on the ground, uh, notably due to security concerns on both the Algerian and the US government side. Um, but uh, but I, can't, I can't complain too much um, uh, and, it, and it certainly um, has been helpful to me to both research Algeria from here and US policy from here, but also uh, to be able to go there as well. Thank you. And uh, last, but uh, last question. Uh, last question here. How can the GCC countries contribute more effectively? This this was addressed by both Mr. Hagag and Ambassador. Ambassador, would you care to comment on that? And that will be our wrap up. It's on. Okay. Uh, Thank you, very, thank you very much. Before, before going to this, I'll just add something about Egypt's position on the Chemical Weapons Convention to what my colleague uh, Karim has just said. Um, in the uh, last General Assembly, uh, the Egyptian Foreign Minister put forward a, uh, an initiative in which he invited all the countries of the region and the, the, the international uh, 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 players to announce their commitment to completely rid the whole region of all weapons of mass destruction and to send their written agreement to that to the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. And the, the next step would be for uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations to put together uh, an implementation format in order to actually get all the uh, countries to sign and ratify whichever conventions dealing with weapons of mass destruction that they had not done, and to convene the uh, international conference on uh, a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East, which should have been held in 2012. Regarding the role that uh, GCC countries can play, uh, I think the most important element that we have to look for in the future is how to get the Arab countries to work together to deal with the different problems that we have in our region. Uh, it has become very clear in the past couple of years that whatever happens in one part of the Arab world will affect the other parts. The, the, it's, it's impossible now for any country to say we are secure and we are happy and we will have nothing to do with w whatever else is happening in the region. So the most important thing to do is to have regional arrangements, not only regarding security issues, political issues, but also regarding economic development, social development, and try to put together a, a more robust, more effective regional bloc, Arab bloc, uh, that will be uh, the, the main driving force for the future in our region. Let me apologize, by the way, to the next panel. We're really over, uh, we've overextended, but I want you to join me all for thanking, uh, to thank the panelists for this wonderful uh, session. Thank you very much. <laughs>